Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Welcome to All Roads Lead to Match. All roads lead to Machu Picchu. Uh, my name is Janelle Fossler, and I'm the program director for International House Ann Arbor, or IHAA. Um, IHAA is a living learning residential community, and under our Global Engagement for Understanding program, we offer around 100 annual events um, and programs as um, part of our sorry, part of our mission to foster understanding and respect for all cultures and identities. Um, and then we are also home to nearly 100 students, scholars, and faculty members from nearly 30 to 40 countries in any given year, um, including the U.S. So we host around 90 events annually, many of which are open to the public. Um, I'm really looking forward to two of our upcoming events, which I'll be sharing more about before the Q&A at the end. Um, but I'm really excited tonight to have Dr. Howard Sai with us. Um, I've known Howard for a while. He asked to be called Howard tonight. So um, I've known Howard for a while. I've always really enjoyed hearing him speak about Peru. Um, his teaching focuses on indigenous communities in South America and the ancient civilizations of Peru and Mexico. Uh, Howard currently teaches at the University of Michigan in the International Studies Program, which is referred to as PICS. And each May, he also leads students to Cusco through a Center for Global and Intercultural Studies, or CGIS program. Um, Howard received his PhD in Anthropology from the University of Michigan um, in Archaeology, and he led a team um, Let's see. And he led a team in excavating the ancient 1,000-year-old village of Las Faras in northern Peru. Um, and recently pu published a book on this topic called Las Faras, Ritual and Ethnicity in the Ancient Andes, which I think you have, right? You showed me at the beginning. I want to, you know. Yeah, you know, do your plug. Little, little product out, you know, placement here, you know, so. All right, that's enough. Perfection. Okay, so before I pass things over to Howard, um, I'd just like to notify everyone that the event is being recorded tonight. Um, we'll probably share it on our YouTube channel or with residents and alumni that were not able to make it tonight. So if you are uncomfortable um, being in the recording, you can pose questions via Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Howard. All right, thank you so much, Janelle. Um, and I really want to thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. I really, uh, it's really is a, is a pleasure to be talking to you about Peru. It's a country that I love visiting year after year after year. And of course, this May, like we, I can't be leading the Cusco program. So I guess this is the way for me to virtually take all of you to uh, Cusco, Peru. It's a way of sort of like, mm, uh, you know, we, we, we do what we can in, uh, 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 in, in these sort of like, uh, uh, in these times. So the talk is today is going to be divided into three parts. And I'm going to take you ultimately to Machu Picchu. But we are also going to follow a storyline, a kind of narrative that tracks the, what we call the Great Inca Rebellion uh, that happened uh, in uh, 1536 with the rebellion of Un uh, Manco Inca against the Spaniards. And there's ultimately he sought refuge in this place called Vilcabamba. And then there's been the search by explorers and archeologists of this lost city or uh, citadel called Vilcabamba. So we'll, 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 we'll also talk about that. So um, to start, the first part, I'll take you guys to Cusco and give you the background to the story of the great Inca rebellion. Of course, we'll start in the, let's go to the airport, huh? I, I just, you know, I, I give a quick comment Facebook that uh, now you don't need to be uh, uh, at a boarding gate five minutes or 15 minutes before the, the, the flight time. So, so uh, you know, just show you the, 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 you know, a little how to get, uh, go to uh, Peru. Uh, there's no direct fly from Detroit to Lima. Usually you fly out um, Atlanta. Another nice place I like to fly out is uh, from Detroit to Miami. Make a nice, you know, little stop in Miami and, and head to uh, Lima, Peru. Here's the Lima Airport. I'm gonna pick up your chicken luggage, um, and they always do this to you. So, so Lima is actually the capital of Peru and it's located on the coast. There's no direct international flights to Cusco yet, 
So you always have to fly to Lima first and then take another hour flight to Cusco. But then they always like fly, fly you in at night. So you always have to end up staying a night in Lima. So you always sort of end up in one of those these hotels around Lima. Uh, and then the first thing <laughs> and the first thing I get to in, in, in Lima, Peru is to head straight to the bar. And then you know to, to get a nice nightcap, and this is the uh, usually they'll give you a, um, a, a a a free a coupon for the the national drink of Peru called the Pisco Sour. I'm not sure anybody has has heard of that or, or tried it before. So uh, it's made from uh, pisco, which is kind of kind of like a like a brandy uh, like liquor. So so have your you know one free Pisco Sour in the Lima. Uh, uh, hotel and the next day you'll you'll um get on the plane to fly to uh, Cusco which is located in the mountains so Lima is on the coast and uh the 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 ancient capital of the Incas Cusco is actually higher up in the Andes mountains so once you're about to land in Cusco you will see some spectacular scenery and landscape uh, out the window let me show you really quick what sort of Cusco is like it's in this valley uh, in the southern highlands of Peru. And some say it's, a, in, it's in the shape of a puma. So here is the, the main plaza of Cusco itself. And the, the city itself is overlooked by this hill that I'll show you later called Saxe Huaman. There are these gigantic Inca ruins on top. And, and the, the, the main plaza is right here. Give another shot. So the history of sort of the, the, uh, the moving the, the capital to Cusco is very interesting. Uh, unlike other cases of sort of uh, Spanish colonialism, for example, Mexico, uh, in, in the case of Mexico, they kept the capital at Tenochtitlan, which was the empire of the, 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 the Aztecs, the capital of the Aztec empire. And after the, the Spanish conquest of Mexico, they kept the, the capital of Mexico in capital city, which is right on top of the old capital of the Aztecs. In the case of Peru, something different happened. Uh, Cusco was too high. And you'll feel it once you reach Cusco. It's about 9,000 feet above uh, sea level. So once you land in Cusco, you, you get really excited. And then you like try to like you know, take a, a quick step. And then you, all of a sudden, you just take, take a deep breath. <sighs> And because you kind of can't breathe. It's, it's really uh, uh, high up there. And, the, and that same thing happened to the, the, the Spanish. They realized some of, of the, um, the Spanish settlers are suffering a lot from the high altitude. It's contributing to sort of a um, uh, 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 low birth rate. It was uh, even affecting sort of um, uh, childbirth of the, of the Spanish people. So they, they had to move the capital uh, down lower to, the, to sea level. So that's why ultimately it's, it's in uh, Lima today. This is really interesting because what that, with that, a lot of the sort of the Inca streets are still left uh, in the old capital, Cusco itself. Uh, the city of Cusco, a lot of streets are very narrow and you, you wonder why they, they built these streets so in, in this sort of like really like kind of confined space. It was because it was a, that was the original um, Inca plan that uh, a lot of streets in Cusco followed the original uh, uh, Inca city plan uh, with the original uh, Inca city walls. So when you go to Cusco today, you can still see long stretches of original uh, Inca walls dating back to uh, five or 600 years ago. And here's one, uh, this is the Loreto Street. I call it um, Starbucks Street because it's like right where they built Starbucks. Uh, and it also happened to have sort of like one of the longest stretch of original Inca walls. And uh, well, Starbucks, actually got to Cusco relatively late in 2013. So, um, so I guess before that, I couldn't have a chance to call a Starbucks tree. So there's some, uh, oh, there you go. And here's, uh, here's that entrance to, to, the, to, the, to the Starbucks right here. So you, you kind of like go in there and there's like a little patio and go uh, and Starbucks on the second floor, which actually like, that Starbucks actually gave you a really nice view of the plaza. And if you're ever wondering what, like, what was this original Inca building for? Why did it have such a like long stretch of 
uh, Inca walls. It was actually this thing called, you probably can't read it, but it's this thing called uh, Akiawasi. Akiawasi, A-C-L-L-A-W-A-S-I. Wasi is a very common term in, in, in Quechua. The language of Incas means house. Whenever you hear Wasi, it means house in Quechua. This was originally uh, the house of the chosen woman. That's what it means. Akia means the chosen ones. So Akia Wasi used to be the house of the chosen woman who sort of, uh, uh, there were these women sort of uh, 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 gathered around from the different provinces of the Inca empire. Uh, and they stayed in this sort of gigantic count compound uh, within the walls of this, within the walls of this, this count compound, which you see here uh, to, uh, you know, make clothing, weave clothing, and to brew beer for, 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 for the Inca state. Uh, so when you go to, you know, Starbucks Street, uh, really look at these walls, you know, they, they look, look at the, you know, these are made by uh, stone. They, they carve stone out of stone. So they got these sort of andesite blocks and they'll use a sort of like a river cobble to pound that piece of andesite block into a square. And then, then that's, that's how they uh, build this wall. And this stretch of Inca walls is very interesting because if you look at it, uh, they could have made this wall flat because they, I mean, they're already pounding this wall. So they don't, they didn't have to sort of like uh, do what they're doing now uh, here. If you look at it closely, they actually make sure to make an accent. Uh, don't play sports in Cusco. But yeah, don't play, don't play soccer. Don't play football like in, in Cusco. You'll, you'll probably um, pass out because of the high altitude. Uh, if you look at this wall closely, they sort of like uh, uh, use a bigger rock um, to sort of like shape it. But when it gets to the edges, go to Cusco. And, and in this talk, I'm going to assume all of you will go to Peru and go visit Cusco. This is like my goal uh, at the end of this talk. But when you're here in Starbucks Street, look at these individual blocks and look at the edges of each of these blocks. They, somebody took an even smaller stone to polish the, the edge of each block to accent the each uh, individual stone block saying that, hey, I made one of these stone blocks. I mean, they could have made it flat. The other architecture uh, in Cusco itself that has really a, a flat surface. But in this case, in, on, on Loreto Street, on, on Starbucks Street, they you know, make sure to emphasize each little block. So that's one kind of Inca architecture, uh, the, the kind that is sort of, um, uh, uh, the square kind. And another kind is, is the famous uh, jigsaw puzzle kind that I think some of you might have seen, seen before. Um, the most famous sort of representative of, 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 of that is the 12 corner stone in Cusco. This rock itself is kind of a local celebrity that is the, what is the most famous rock. Everybody go, go and see it. It's even on the, the beer bottle of Peru, of, of, of Cusco, of the Cuscania beer. So when you order a Cuscania beer uh, in Cusco, th this rock will be, the, uh, will be there on the, on the bottle. It's called the 12 corner stone or 12 side, because we you count all the sides, uh, there's, there's 12 sides, as it has 12 corners and 12 sides. So in another lecture, I'll tell you how this was made. But uh, uh, it's basically a sliding technique on top. But but uh, just 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 to let you know that this is uh, the local celebrity. Um, and sometimes when you walk on this uh, the, the the jigsaw puzzle street, there you'll find a guy dressed like an Inca protecting the stone uh, because by sort of um, uh, local city regulations, you're not allowed to touch the twelve corner stone. So he's there to prevent. Uh, annoying uh, a tourist from touching this uh, tall corner. It's really funny because like you could touch like you know rocks like five you know five rocks down you could touch that but you just can't touch the, the tall corner stone. So uh, here's another thing that I'm going to be uh, 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 mm, yes and oh, I, uh, we we have no indication that it was actually sacred back in the days. Uh, it's almost like there's like a lot of myth making in modern times uh, uh, emphasis about how this is like a really special storm because it has, has 12 corners. So if anything, if anything, 
the square rocks are the more prestigious kind of construction under the Inca Empire in Cusco. These kind of architecture are actually associated with uh, palaces. Uh, again, the, the house of the chosen woman is more higher status uh, uh, buildings. The jigsaw puzzle ones actually like they're, they're actually the foundation of another platform. So there's, these are actually not actual palace walls. They're actually the, only the base. So, so, so the 12 corner rock really is kind of like a modern construction. And uh, there's, there's actually an article written about how, how, um, how this 12 corner rock gained its sort of a, a legendary status in, in the 20th century. So, and there's another thing I want, another theme I want to touch upon in this uh, talk is the, um, sort of the, the importance of like tourism and the use of sort of like Inca identity. So I think these two ladies are like, Dress as um, uh, uh, one of these Inca chosen women, and I think they're shooting a beer commercial. So I'm not, I'm not uh, so sure what they were doing, but but it it, it 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 you see a lot of sort of like reenactment of of uh, uh, Inca persons on on in Cusco uh, for commercial purposes. Remember that hill top uh, 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 site I was talking about uh, that overlooks Cusco called uh, uh, Saksai Wan Man. I'll, I'll type these, these things for you. So Saksai Wan Man. And all the tour guides will say, oh, you know, it sounds like sexy woman, you know, it's a sexy woman, but you know, that's okay. Like, I've heard that like, you know, 20 times. So um, so this is uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the hilltop fort of uh, Saksai Wan Man. When you zoom in, you'll see how gigantic uh, these walls are. Uh, it's it's one of the very prominent features here is are these like zigzag walls, uh, and they're built in like three different uh, uh, or more levels. And let's 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 go in. We'll, we'll see how like gigantic these things really are. It's like so. Here it is at the, each corner of the zigzag, and that's my um, host mom uh, in Cusco, Vicky. So she's standing to one of them. And you know when when you're looking at the 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 stone blocks and, and and you know Starbucks Street, they're about this size. And archaeologists have been able to replicate and make these blocks. But when you come to Saxe Oman, you just you're just like wow, you just you just are really stunned by the 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 scale and magnitude of the, the rocks they're carving. You're just like how, you know, it's 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 just sheer rope and 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 uh manpower but you're just like how you know so they're they're even fitting these gigantic uh pieces of like you know jigsaw puzzle uh onto Saksai Wan Man and so here and then we're gonna hit the story of um uh the great Inca rebellion um so after the rapid you know capture and and execution of the Inca king Altawalpa uh, in Cajamarca in, in uh, 1533, that's, that's when he was uh, killed, they, the Spaniards installed a puppet king called Manco Inca. So like, they want him to be like a, like a puppet um, ruler of, of, of Peru. Uh, they really were quite abusive to him and they, they were really mean to him. So then he, he turned around and initiated a, uh, a rebellion in uh, 1536. So he uh, gather all the Incas and, and the Inca generals and start attacking the Spanish uh, 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 conquerors. And one of the sort of the, 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 cl uh, the climax of the showdown between the Incas and the Spanish was actually to ask Sacsayhuaman itself. Uh, the Inca rebels were actually defending Sacsayhuaman with the attacking uh, Spaniards. And here's a one scene from, from one of the battles. And this was uh, Juan Pizarro, this guy sort of like riding around uh, with like a, like no helmet and kind of like a handkerchief around his uh, jaw. What happens he was, this is the, the, the brother of the famous uh, Francisco Pizarro, the main architect of the conquest. So he's one of the Pizarro brothers, Juan Pizarro. Uh, in a previous battle, he was hit in the jaw, kind of like dislocated his jaw. So like, it really hurts. So, so he's like, you know what? Like, I'm going to just like, you know, like just like, bandage it and and I, I can't wear a helmet because the, the helmet then hurts my jaw so he he rolled out uh, without a helmet and then 
uh, and then he was like bonk in the head by by one of these the, the, the Inca slingers with th- 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 one of these uh, sling stones. Uh, you ever seen those things in action? It, they 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 travel at a very fast speed. It, they could cause a lot of damage. These sl- sling stones, so that that killed them. Uh, despite sort of like uh, killing Juan Pizarro, the Incas ultimately lost this battle, and they couldn't uh, defend Sacsayhuaman. So they had to retreat in uh, further retreat into uh, uh, into the Sacred Valley, and that brings me into the second part of this talk. Um, Vilcabamba or the retreat into the Sacred Valley. So Monco Inca gather his men, and then they go to um, this valley, sort of uh, just north of Cusco itself. And when you go visit Cusco nowadays, you when you, you get a full like tour tour package, you'll definitely visit the Sacred Valley because that's the area where a lot of really amazing, beautiful Inca sites are uh, in this, this uh, Sacred Valley, Chinchero, Pisac, Ollante Tambo. And then right now, I just want to show you um, Ollante Tambo itself. So it's also on the way to Machu Picchu. So you definitely like go to the Sacred Valley and then uh, and then take another train from Ollante Tambo to, 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 um, to Machu Picchu. Let me, Oyantai Tambo. There you go. And here it is. Here it is, um, Oyante Tambo. Here is that the, the river of the Sacred Valley called the Urubamba River. And at one point in the valley, there's another river coming from the north uh, called the Patacancha. So the site of uh, Oyante Tambo is located at the confluence or where these two rivers meet it's like right here and they built these like gigantic inca um ruin oh sorry it's a, ru- a ruin nowadays but gigantic inca complex uh in the, in the side of the hill and here it is so cusco the city itself may be like a little bit like too touristic sometimes you know you, you it's 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 i have my love and hate Love hate relationship with Cusco, but Oyante Tambo still has a beautiful, like little town charm uh, of, of of the Andes. So I I I actually prefer Oyante Tambo slightly more than Cusco. So, and here is that uh, here's a picture of Oyante Tambo taken from the the opposite the hillside. You can see these sort of like they built these gigantic terraces uh, going into the mountains, and there's a there's a complex just just above these, uh, these terraces. And there's a sort of like a gigantic staircase going up to the, to the Inca uh, structure. And here you see a photo of that, of, that, uh, of that terrace. So it's a really amazing, Oyante Tambo has one of the sort of most amazing Inca stonework uh, in, in the Sacred Valley. Here it is. The really interesting thing about Oyante Tambo is that you can still see Inca construction uh, happening. It's almost like somebody w- wiped out a city, uh, you know, in, in a very short amount of time and all the construction will stop. You know, think about how much construction there is in Ann Arbor. And if that suddenly all stop, all you will get is all the construction equipment and uh, uh, all, all the sort of like uh, you know, uh, half finished construction sites. And here you see, I'm going to talk about there. And I love this photo because. Here you see stones being dragged up. They're in the process of being dragged up to the construction site. Uh, and Oyante Tambo is really some of the some of the stone monuments. Here's one in uh, uh, in Oyante Tambo. It's just like four gigantic, uh, probably five. I think it's five gigantic sort of blocks. And then they 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 set them there. But then they built this little like uh, tiny sort of like slip of a stone. Like a fillet to go in between them, so it's just they they they're just playing with stone. They're playing with rocks. Uh, so I really love Oyante Tambo, and um, the reason I brought up uh, Oyante Tambo is because this was uh, uh, the almost the, the Incas' last stand in the Sacred Valley against the Spanish. But here, uh, the Incas actually scored their probably only victory against the Spanish. They uh, uh, were attacking from this like uh, hilltop position. So they really let the Spanish uh, have it, throwing stones, arrows, slings uh, from a, uh, uh, like, like a, 
uh, more advantageous, higher position. And when the Spaniards were trying to siege the town, they diverted the Patacancha River and sort of uh, uh, swept away uh, uh, most of the, uh, the attacking Spanish army. So, so this is the only time that the Incas uh, scored a major victory against the Spanish in the Great Inca Rebellion. So, and here is the original Inca gate uh, to, to, to Ollante Tambo. Uh, um, so, and, when, and here's a picture of the, the, the Michigan group in 2019. And despite this victory against the Spanish, uh, Manco Inca still decided that he cannot hold out uh, Ollante Tambo any longer. So he retreated uh, deeper into the jungle, uh, downriver uh, uh, of, of, of Ollante Tambo and then into sort of uh, uh, what we call sort of the, 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 the selva zone of the Andes, the, e the eastern slope of the Andes, which is basically a, a tropical forest in the jungle. So there are Inca sites around uh, Oyante Tambo that uh, show you traces of that. That's burning. That's these structures getting burned. This is must, must have been like a storage house. So when the Incas were retreating, they basically practiced scorched earth. They burned all their uh, storehouses, all their crops on the way out uh, to, 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 to their retreat in, in the jungle. So that is, this is a part of the Inca trail. Uh, I took this image from Google Street View showing the, the path of the Incas uh, go, going into this deep jungle city called um, Vilcabamba, which I'll which are now I'm coming up to the third part of the talk. Uh, uh, so there the Incas held out for another uh, approximately 40 years. It was, it was from, uh, they, they, the, the, the Incas actually established almost a rebel Inca state in uh, this place called Vilcabamba. Let me write this down for you all. Bamba. And there are a succession of three Inca kings uh, in Vilcabamba. And ultimately, in the year of 1572, um, they got a new Spanish viceroy uh, coming to Peru. And he just he just had it. He's like, what are you guys doing? Letting the Inca sort of like hide out, hide out in the jungles for like 40 years. Like, let's 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 like really do something about it. So uh, this is uh, um, Viceroy uh, Toledo. And so he launched uh, this uh, massive attack on the, the Inca city of Vilcabamba. And, and, and at this time, the Inca king in Vilcabamba was this guy called uh, Tupac Amaru. Um, when they attacked uh, Vilcabamba, uh, uh, Tupac Amaru and his wife, and, and, and you know, some, some on his entourage, uh, went deeper and deeper into the jungle. The Spanish sent a captain called Captain Loyola to pursue Tupac Amaru uh, and his company. And ultimately he reached uh, this point in, in, uh, in, a, uh, in a river, by the river. And, and this, is, this is the scene that you would have seen. I think that's, that's Captain Loyola, Loyola here. And that's uh, Tupac Amaru and his uh, pregnant wife. And this is the moment that he captured them. And what happened was this, and he, he, he approached them very sort of like gently, just, just make sure not to scare them. And what happens with this, they, they, the, the, the Inca king Tupac Amaru and his wife made it to the river. They had a chance to sort of get on the canoe and, and sail down the, the, this river in the Amazon and escape. However, his wife was uh, afraid of the water and, and she was afraid uh, for her child. So, so, so she, she, she just didn't want to get in a canoe. And, and instead of uh, abandoning her, Tupac Amaru decided to, to stay with her uh, but by the campfire. And that was the moment when sort of, um, and, then, and that's why they were captured by, by the Spanish captain, uh, Loyola. He was captured, tried, and then executed in the, um, in the plaza of Cusco very swiftly in 1572. And so 1572 really marked the end of uh, 
uh, the, the great Inca rebellion. Um, and so, so for, for, for ages, uh, archaeologists, explorers wanted to look for this, this, where is, where is Vilcabamba? You know, like, uh, we know that it ha- it's, a, it's a historical place, but where is it? So, and that's what uh, created the legend around uh, this explorer called Hiram Beam and, uh, and his discovery of Machu Picchu. Quick spoiler here that Machu Picchu really uh, isn't Vilcabamba. We know that. And then the real Vilcabamba has been found and has been excavated uh, recently by a team of uh, Peruvian and U.S. archaeologists. So, but, 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 but Hiram Beam himself always thought Machu Picchu was Vilcabamba because Machu, because Machu Picchu so impressed him. It was so, it was so beautiful. He just had to believe that Machu Picchu was, um, was Vilcabamba. So, but we know that Vilcabamba is much, much deeper in the jungle than, um, here's a, here's a weird irony. He actually found Vilcabamba too. Uh, Hiram Beam made it to, uh, the, the ruins of Vilcabamba, but he didn't believe that it was, it was it. So, uh, so he, he just he, he stuck his theory that Machu Picchu was Vilcabamba. So the, so go to go to Machu Picchu. You take a train from Oyante Tambo, and here's here's a train with the the Michigan students. It's a beautiful beautiful train ride because you're following the Urubamba River, and uh, and you're going sort of downriver, and that the scenery becomes uh, lusher and lusher, uh, uh, greener and greener as you enter sort of the, the the tropical part on the eastern slope of the Andes. And here's Machu Picchu. So you will I'm not sure you can see the bottom part. You're staying in the, um, there's like a, like a modern town called Aguas Calientes on the bottom. And then uh, from there, uh, you'll take a bus that goes up this sort of like zigzag road, uh, named the Hiram Beam Road. It was built in the uh, 1940s, like the zigzag uh, up to, to the, uh, the site of Machu Picchu itself. And this is the town of Aguas Calientes. And, and here's that, here's that uh, uh, bus ride. And when you sort of like, I guess you know you're prone to car sickness. You know, you probably had to. She you should take something before going on the bus because it's just like when they do that zigzag, it's just they they really do a hard zigzag. However, that one last switchback, that all of a sudden like Machu Picchu pops out, and it always reminds me of like I always seeing in my head the theme song to Jurassic Park is always obviously as always that's always the the, the theme for for when. Uh, um, Machu Picchu shows up because it, it, it really has that sort of like uh, uh, theme park feel to it, you know? So, so I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here, here. So here's that iconic shot of uh, Machu Picchu. Uh, there's actually one spot we could take this. They, they, they all tell you that's, that's how you could do it. And then uh, this is actually what it really looks like. It's, it's the, the tourist traffic is actually, you know, just so, you know, just for you to not be shocked and surprised when you get to Machu Picchu, there's a lot of tours there. There's a, almost a very like Disneyland feel to it. It's still beautiful, still wonderful. Please go there, but just to, you know, be mentally prepared that there's, there's a lot of tourism there. So um, here's that, here's uh, the entrance. The interesting thing is that they uh, follow what would have been the original entrance into Machu Picchu itself. Machu Picchu had, in, back in Inca times, a one single entrance, and they also made it into like the tourist entrance. So it's very convenient. Uh, so then it's right here. And when you go to the other side, you see that it has these mechanisms by which you can lock the doors. And we don't know how exactly it works. There are these two little like holes in the side, and then there's a little donut loop on top. And when you look in the holes, it's like these, these like bar hole thing. It's like, you know. You know, Hiram Beam had a theory about how this was locked. They're like he's like you put logs over it and you tie it up. So, um, um, immediately when you enter uh, uh, Machu Picchu, you you the, the first sector you encounter is actually a very high status, prestigious sector. I guess they all are, but this one is really interesting. Uh, it's associated with the, the 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 king's room. We really think that's where the, the king's chamber was. It has this like uh, there's another really special structure. It's, it's a it's a it's a natural rock, but then they built a curved wall around it. Then and that's a very in, uh, common Inca practice is to like almost frame or uh, a circle a natural feature and then and then and somehow worship or make offering to that. 
The interesting thing about this thing, uh, this structure, is that it has only two open windows, and the sun will hit this rock in the middle uh, on the June and December solstice. So they time it perfectly that the the, the sunlight would hit the uh, rock on these dates. And there are a lot of orientations of uh, in uh, Machu Picchu that do that. There are a lot of sort of these uh, astronomical orientations uh, um, in, in 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 Machu Picchu. Uh, but just to give you another kind of, they also oriented uh, certain structures to peaks in the background. For example, um, this is the mountain peak called uh, Yananti. So this this is like a bath. Here's the here's the here's the king's uh, um uh, room. I, I really think this is the king's room because it's the only room that has a bathroom. If you if you follow this thing, in, there's, there's actually a little like like a it's almost like a squatter. You're like, oh, this is like, and this is like the only room in like in Machu Picchu that has a bathroom. So that has to be reserved for the king. Uh, and, and then outside of it, there's like a little jacuzzi. It's actually a bath. It has like natural uh, spring water going in. And it's it's completely oriented to the peak of Yananti. So the king would have just like sat in the, in the, in the, uh, in a bath and look at the um, Mount Yananti. And there's another other feature in Machu Picchu that imitates uh, the the shape of Yananti, they carved this rock to sort of like to, to imitate uh, the 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 slope and shape of uh, this this peak called Yananti. Um, I think the one last feature I'll show you is the uh, the highest place in uh, Machu Picchu. This thing called the Intihuatana. Uh, they, you know, the old interpretation is that it's some kind of um. Uh, um sundial um, but we know it's a very uh, important structure however i think something like you know 10 years ago they're filming a beer commercial again you know they love to uh associate inca with beer and there was an accident where the equipment fell and it chipped the like corner of, of the of this the sunstone so you can see it here um yeah. i'm gonna finish out with the um the controversy over the machu picchu artifacts uh, that uh, when Hiram Beam uh, excavated uh, Machu Picchu, he shipped back a lot of the, the artifacts uh, to Yale, and there they stayed until uh, 2013. Uh, in the last like you know, 10, 15 years, there's been a campaign from Peru to uh, uh, take back the, the the Machu Picchu artifacts from Yale, and it 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 they really wanted to back by 2011, because that would have been the 100 year anniversary of the discovery of Machu Picchu, which is 1911. The, the deal didn't sort of go through until around sort of 2013. And that's when they really, you know, that's when Yale really returned the artifact. And this is like our sort of uh, local uh, partner uh, in Cusco, uh, Dr. Jean-Jacques de Coster. Uh, he was the, the first uh, director of uh, the Machu Picchu Museum. So when they returned the Machu Picchu uh, artifacts, they went to this museum. So there's also sort of that, that sort of um, uh, 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 almost sort of a, a modern battle over the cultural heritage of Peru and, and, and the symbolic importance of Machu Picchu uh, to the Peruvian people. So... I think I went over time. I'm really sorry. Um, I will end with the um, with a Q and A at the at the hotel bar. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Howard. That was so interesting. Um, so, if people have questions, you can unmute your mic and ask, or if you're more comfortable, you can put them in the chat. And I'll start because I'm really curious about this, but where did your interest in this part of the world and archeology span in Machu Picchu or Cusco, like where did this stem from? Can you remember? Yeah, you know, so, so, so it's really funny because like I get, uh, I get that question a lot. And if you look on YouTube, I actually answer it on YouTube. Uh, it's, it's actually like one of my, one of my one-on-one uh, videos. Uh, it's it's almost like uh, I always wanted to do archaeology. I, I I always I always uh, wanted to to uh, pursue that 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 study since high school, since since middle school. So, but I didn't know where, and that was always the question. Um, so I, I think it was was one time 
and I was at I was at UCLA. I was an undergrad. I was at, a, at this like archaeology talk at UCLA, and one of my professors kind of like came up to me, and tapped me in the back, and he's like, "This this is a guy called a uh, Char Stanish, Chip Stanish." And he's like, "I come out like when I talk to me in the hallway." I was like, "Oh," he's like, "Yeah, like." I, Hey, like Howard, I, 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 have, I, have a, I have a colleague who wants to, who, you know, who's running a project in, in Peru and like in, in the summer. Would you like to like work with her? I was like, oh yeah, sure, of course, you know. So like, and then that was Carol Mackey, and then um, and 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 um, and that and that's how I ended up working in Peru. And once I got to Peru, it was a country. Uh, I'm not sure you can you kind of you know I just I mentioned it briefly. It's a country that has a lot of uh, ecological diversity and has many different environmental zones. So the coast is like desert, the mountain is like the mountains, and then you go down to, to, the, to, the, to the east, you enter sort of the, the, the tropical forest. So it's almost like you're excavating in different countries within one country. You see all sorts of different like archeological ruins in, in one country. And that's why I like, kind of like fell in love with Peru. And uh, it, it's, 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 just, it's just such an interesting country. Uh, people are super nice. There's like I I I, got, I forgot to thank sort of like all my uh, Peruvian colleagues and 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 uh, host families who like who who made all my research possible uh, over the years. Um, and fantastic food and and delicious uh, pisco sour. So you can't go wrong, Peru. So. Should I check the chat? For just any questions? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, thanks, 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 everybody. It's always kind of hard to see the um the chat sometimes. You're just like, oh. Sorry. Hey, Howard. <clears throat> this is Valentin speaking. Uh, really great presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I was curious to know: does um, was Machu Picchu a, a special place for the Incas in terms of? Uh, Religious, religious aspect or something? Yeah, th thank you. Very, very good question. Um, it, 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 in terms of like Inca sites, there's always something uh, uh, ceremonial about it. So like, so I guess sort of life back then, you, you never stop making offerings and, and ceremonies. Uh, even, even modern day, like Peruvian, uh, uh, more traditional Peruvian society, you see them making sort of a lot of offerings to, to the earth, to the mountains. So it's, it's so, so it's, so it's very common. And for the longest time, people kind of couldn't figure out what Machu Picchu was about. Like what, like why I was here. And, and, and um, about sort of in, in the 1970s, a historical document showed up in the, in the archives, in the colonial historical archives. And it, it mentioned a, a patch of land called uh, Picchu, which we, we, we think is, you know, Machu Picchu. Um, and they said it was it was the estate, kind of the land of um, this Inca king called Pachacuti. So this is a really interesting uh, system of, of 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 Inca land inheritance, is that each Inca king, uh, and this caused a lot of like annoyance to few like later Inca kings. Each Inca king never died; it just turned to a living mummy, and they still carried the king around. And that king still kept his land that he like acquired and conquered in his lifetime. So apparently this, this mummy Inca king, Pachacuti, owned Machu Picchu. And that was when he like conquered it. So if any kind of like ceremony or, or, or travel, it would involve uh, Pachacuti, the mummy itself, and, his, and, a, and a mummy a retinue uh, carrying uh, uh, Pachacuti to, uh, to, to, to Machu Picchu. Um, yeah, and, and, and there are a lot of these sort of like uh, uh, astronomical alignments, as, as I mentioned. There's one cave uh, beneath Machu Picchu, and that's oriented towards, um, they, they actually, uh, um, it, a lot of times you know these things are deliberate because they will actually build a wall and do it like a slit. So the light would just come in in the December solstice. So it's not no accident that, that, that they'll, they'll do that. So. There, there are many, many interesting things about Machu Picchu. Um, actually, let me show you, let me show you. There, there, I skip a couple of slides. This is a great time to, to, to show you these things. Um, there's one of, here we go. 
okay this is like this is like the um the google earth of the machu picchu is built on this like narrow ridge between uh two mountain peaks uh one is called huayna picchu um, which means uh young peak another one is what's the name you know it's named after machu picchu old peak machu means old Huayna means young the higher one is called uh, machu picchu and then when you go up to, um, this is what I tell all my students, like take a compass. They, they, they probably all use a phone now, so you don't use a compass. When you get up to, the, to Machu Picchu, and then um, I, have a, I, actually, I have a picture of that. Um, and this is, this, is, this is like, and this is like us actually like making it up there. Uh, after like, it, it takes about like 40, 50 minutes to like walk up to like Machu Picchu. It's kind of like a really hard, hard trek and they're all celebrating. But once you're there, you take your compass and you'll see that perfectly to the cardinal directions, to the uh, to the north, east, and west are these three like uh, snow peak mountains, and 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 it's just like oh, like how you know, like it's 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 uh, the 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 archaeologist uh, uh, Johann Reinhardt really makes the argument that they, they deliberately put it there, but you know it, it really is really uncanny how uh, that the placement of Machu Picchu itself so. I have a question. Um, was it um, buried and found, or was it just um, hidden in a place that wasn't visible for the average, um, you know, explorer? Yeah. Um, um, it it it. it uh, Hiram Beam was able to reach uh, Machu Picchu because of a new road. That the um, Peruvian government blasted through uh, to to ship out um, sugar and and um, and uh, rubber out, out of out of, the, out of the forest. So he followed that road, that newly created road uh, to Ma to Machu Picchu. When he got there, and this is always a thing that like, like that's like very controversial that we shouldn't say he discovered it. People, the Peruvian people still, excuse me, still live on Machu Picchu. There's a farmer who is still using the Inca terraces to farm, to grow crops. So there are actually people living on, on Machu Picchu. And, 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 he, and he, they, they found this family and it's a, it was a little boy uh, who took him to see uh, Machu Picchu. So, and so um, I, think his, I think his guide at, at the time was like too hungover that day. And he was like, ah, I don't wanna go. Ah, I'm just gonna like sit here and like drink some water, hydrate. And then so like, ah, let's, let's just go with that boy up to Machu Picchu. So the boy then, and, and the boy shows up in the, um, uh, many photos, uh, in 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 in, in, in Hiram Beam's photo, and he was actually the one who showed Hiram Beam where Machu Picchu was, and when he got there, it was uh, I wish I could show you a, a you know like a, a picture of sort of old, uh, old Machu Picchu. You really can't. It's just covered in trees. This is completely uh, whatever you see, an archaeological site that looks like this. You know, like it, whenever you see something that looks. It's too clean. There's, there's no no archeo, no real ruin archaeological site actually looks like this. this you, you could tell this has been uh, uh, yeah, cleaned, partially sort of rebuilt. Uh, so 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 the you know I'll probably send you guys a link to like an old picture of Machu Picchu. You, you just imagine the whole place uh, covered in forest. However, uh, Hiram Beam was still able to uh, see the walls, and he still thought it was a very significant um, area. So. Does that, I hope that, I hope that answered the question. Yes, very much. Thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. I do want to kind of show you something. There, there is the, the one, I guess the one thing special about Hiram Beam was that he brought with him a Kodak camera. So, so, you know, people knew about Machu Picchu, people who lived there, but it was really Hiram Beam, Kodak, the, 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 the three elements and National Geographic. This was the 1914 issue of National Geographic that made uh, 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 Machu Picchu famous. And I have one of the, this is not the Hiram Beam camera, but it's, it's the camera from that era. It's, it, it is actually, it's, it's a Kodak 2A, the one he used. So, and uh, there you go. boom, that's like, uh, I, I got it from like a, a camera store in Dearborn. 
they like they 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 had one. I was like, whoa! It's like I'm gonna. It was like a hundred bucks. I was like, of course I'm gonna get it. And it's like a really good condition. I think I could, I could still take pictures with it. So and then, and it goes like this. It's one of those those billow billow cameras and a stand. So and the the viewfinder is like here. So you actually you hold it like on, on your like belly and you look down and then you're like and then and this this and this is actually the um the shutter you you, you click on this thing and goes pop so. Yeah, so it, it was just this sort of confluence of the the three factors, right? Him, him, him having uh, photographic technology in the early 1900s uh, with uh, National Geographic that really launched um, Machu Picchu into his fame. So, Howard, you mentioned um, that Hiram thought that he had found a different ruin. I can't remember the name of the other location, although you put it in the chat, but I forgot it. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. He 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 really thought that was the the last Inca refuge called uh, uh, Vilca Bamba, Vilca Bamba. So yeah. if we if we Google Vilca Bamba, we can see pictures of that place too. Has it been? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Not not really. It's still really remote. It's still really yeah. Not a lot of tourists go there. It's, it's really deep, and then and then for a time was it's like in modern times, it was like still dangerous. Because um, so a, a lot of uh, drug cartel, like uh, 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 narco traffic, uh, uh, you know, narco traficantes like control that route. So, so like, like don't go there because like you know it was it was dangerous even even you know as of like five or seven years ago. So, and then and no no no, it's like it's um, kind of a rough track. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think it's safer now. I think now they actually have like a uh, uh, tour, like tour agencies that run run sort of uh, 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 Vilca Bama tours. Um, it's been excavated. That the, the it's actually been uh, the report was released by um, Brian Bauer, uh, and it was a it was a UCLA publication. So, so so there's some initial like investigation of of Vilca Bamba. There's there's like there's like European roof tiles, really interesting. They like they they start adapting more like Spanish art architecture. They 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 they're putting up like uh you know European Spanish style uh, roof roof tiles. So it's just, it's just fascinating. It's a really fascinating site. But it's very hard to work. You know this is why I chose to work in the on a desert on the coast. Like like uh, I. I you know the 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 jungle or the rainforest just like basically wants to kill you. It's it's a it wants to eat you alive. Um, it, it you know this is go back goes back to uh, Janelle's like you know question about why I started working in Peru. You know I first like uh, wanted to be a Mayanist. I, I, I my first sort of experience was in Belize, and like so like I worked in the, on these Mayan ruins in the jungles of Belize, and let me it was rough. It was you know it's they're, they're just like the bugs. There are snakes, there are killer bees, like everything wants to kill you. And then you go to Peru, it's like, ah, it's like, that's ah, nice. You know, it's like, it's, it's not that bad. But uh, but you, you see how green um, Machu Picchu is. It, it's actually on the gateway into the, um, the, uh, the tropical uh, uh, landscape. So did I have any? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, th there, there's a lot of metal work actually. Um, uh, um, the really famous one is like a, they they usually they usually show you uh, in the museum is a tupu it's like a like a metal pin like for a sh uh, like a shawl just uh, like the, a lot of Inca ladies will have like a blanket and they'll secure it with a, a metal pin but they have fantastic especially on uh, where I work on the north coast they have fantastic fantastic metal work silver and gold um, and this was actually what like drove the Spanish mad. Because the um the the Incas had these spectacular uh, gold work, and when the first Inca king was uh, uh, captured, Atahualpa, uh, uh, before Manco, right, um, he tried to like he tried to uh, uh, ransom himself by paying the Spanish. He's like, if you guys let me go, I'll give you like lots of gold, okay? So so he he was in this room and he said, I'll fill this room up with like gold up to here. So he raised his hand. This is the famous for um. The, the the gold room, he like he raised his hand, and then the, the Spanish didn't believe him. It's like really you could, you could do that, like that much gold, and then and and within weeks they're like uh, these these llama caravans to start carrying gold in, into uh, into Cajamarca into where he was captured. 
and they, and they fill it up uh, with gold. They still didn't let him go. And he said, you know, oh, I should, what should, hold this, hold this, hold this. I'll do it twice. I'll do this room twice with silver. Okay, like, like let me go after that, huh? And then like, and, and he did it. He did it again. Uh, and then they still didn't let him go. And then and then they they finally accused him of trying to like launch a rebellion and, and then kill Otawapa. So, and we know this, yeah, you know, just, it's a very, if you read the, the history of the conquest, it's really sad, even after what happened, even after the, the, the Monko Inca rebellion, there's a, little, a lot of sad episodes uh, in the whole conquest. Um, we know this really happened because the Spanish actually kept like detailed records of like how, how many people, how, uh, uh, how, like a receipt of like how much each people got for, in terms of gold and, and among the 168 Spaniards who were there. They were like, we, we know the exact number of uh, Spanish uh, conquerors were there uh, when, when they got that gold, the, the, the ransom room, it was 168. Uh, James Lockhart wrote the book called Men of Cajamarca. And he provided like mini biographies of each of these 168 uh, Spanish men. Yeah, there was a yeah, there was an anecdote that 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 the Incas actually uh, very valued clothing textile because that's the one that really takes a lot of time to make. I mean, they did value gold, but the way the Spanish really love gold, and at some point they're like, did hey like are these guys really are they eating gold? It's like it's that it's like is that is that a thing? Is that is that their food? You know, so. Are there any last questions? I don't, I don't mind if you have any more questions. I just, yeah, so I, could, I could go over stuff. This was so excellent, Howard. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.